Well, thank you so much for being with us, Catherine. Hey, thanks for having me. This is exciting. Uh, I'm glad you guys are focusing on 13, you know, very dear to my heart, this movie. You can see the poster hanging up in my <laughs> wall. <laughs> Yeah, well, it was a tough choice for me because you made a lot of my favorite movies as a, you starting as a production designer, Tombstone, Three Kings, and Tapeheads. One, yeah. of, my, one of my all-time obscure movies. Anybody out there want to see a John Cusack movie? Uh, one of my faves. But you also directed Lords of Dorktown, Nativity, and Twilight. So you have, this is a, lot of, a lot of films to choose from. Uh, but 13 is really something really special. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Yeah. All right, so we'll go back. So you're, you're, you're a production designer. You're working with great directors like Lisa Kolodenko, Cameron Crowe, David O. Russell, Richard Linklater, you're, to name a few, just a few. What inspired you to move from production design to want to write a script for your directorial debut? Oh, good, great question. I had gone to UCLA. Uh, first, I was an architect, University of Texas, and then I switched into, got inspired to join the film business. And uh, because I thought it would be more creative than architecture, I thought it would encourage creativity. I didn't know about sequels and everything at that time. But uh, so I came out to UCLA and, and went to film school, grad school in animation. So I started making, you know, my own films, but then I needed to make a living and people said, hey, you're an architect. Why don't you production design my movie? So I just started making money and loved production design, loved working with us and other great directors. But in between every single job, I would be writing my own screenplay, you know, taking acting classes, taking writing workshops going to classes like this, listening to great filmmakers. So I wrote many other scripts that got optioned but never got made until finally I, I had to keep writing a smaller budget, smaller budget, smaller budget, because I realized that a lot of my idols like Richard Linklater, his first movie, Slacker cost $7,000. David O. Russell's first movie cost $70,000. So I thought I better write something that's more personal, that nothing can stop me from making it. Um, that's how it happened. Well, partly how it happened. All right. So I, you know, I'm, I love, I'm a student of Hollywood history. I don't recall many screenwriting duos that included a middle school teenager. <laughs> so how did that collaboration start between you, you and Nikki Reed, who ultimately played Evie? Well, I had known Nikki since she was five years old, and I thought she was a little super smart, like very creative. I was taking comedy improv classes at that time, so I would be a better director, and uh, I would do comedy improv with Nikki. I'd walk out on the boardwalk where I live in Venice Beach, and then I would just go up to people without even telling her and say, hey, you guys want to buy a child? I'm selling her, and she would just improv immediately go, I'll wash your windows and we would just roll and just shock people and have fun. So I always thought Nikki was so bright and smart and funny and creative and I loved her. And at the time I went away to do a movie in Vancouver as a production designer. When I came back, when I left, she was funny wearing her overalls running around. But when I came back, she had the dark cloud over her head. She had like three hours worth of hair and makeup. She hated her mother who she always had loved before, hated everybody in the world, except she didn't hate me because I was kind of like the aunt or something. So I thought, what happened to this girl in the last few months while I was gone? And it was a discovery. So at first it was kind of like, um, maybe I can help her. I'm not a therapist. I'm not trained or anything, but I was naively thinking, hey, I'll get her to do creative stuff instead of destructive stuff. We'll, we'll go learn. I'll teach her how to serve. I'll teach her how to draw. We'll go to museums. And she gamely tried these things and I'd bring her friends along. But then she said, you know, Catherine, these are the things you like to do. I don't really like surfing. I don't really like drawing. What I really want to do is be an actor. Now, I was almost in shock because I thought that's going to increase her anxiety to be an actor. She's already waking up at uh, middle school. She was already waking up at 5.30 a.m., putting a picture of J-Lo up on the wall and matching the makeup for two hours before she went to middle school. And if you're an actor, I thought that's even going to make, you know, increase her own insecurity about her looks and everything. 
So I thought, but you don't say that to a kid. You don't want to, I don't want to, you know, squash her dreams. If that's what she loved, I'm like, okay, let me find a way to encourage it in a healthy way. So I took her to some acting classes and I realized most of the subject matter for those of you guys that have been to acting classes, it's got, you know, uh, stories about adultery and all this stuff. I'm, I realized immediately this is not appropriate. She's only 13 years old. So then I said, hey, some of my favorite actors, they write their own material. So why don't we write our own comedy that'll be more age appropriate for you to be in? <laughs> and then we, so we thought we we're going to write a teen comedy. Woo! And then as we were writing it, I'm like, well, it's got to be grounded. It's got to be real. The stuff you're really going through. Meanwhile, at the same time, all of her friends would come over and do slumber parties and, you know, beach parties at my house. I was trying to, you know, be a, a good friend helping her through this troubled time. And we started saying, well, let's write about the real issues you guys are going through at school. And the more we started writing about the real stuff, we realized maybe it's not going to be a comedy. <laughs> Maybe it's going to be about real stuff that people are going through. And uh, then we started, the way we wrote it was really fun. Uh, we acted out every scene live. I played her mother. I played her best friend. I played the boyfriend, whatever. We, we never sat down when we wrote until we would act out a scene. We would yell. We would scream, do everything. Then I would sit down on the computer and write it, you know. I mean, I even have, this, I found this picture of Nikki and I, look at the old school computer, hilarious, you know, <laughs> where we're sitting at the desk, you know, coming up with ideas and stuff. So it was very uh, live process. And actually, it seems like it, that's a really interesting process, because it definitely helped me capture the 13 year old voices. Like oh having that kind of, you know, just make it feel, that's why it felt so real to me. And one thing that there was something really cool um, for those that have taken comedy improv classes, we know the rule, yes, and. And at first we had actually only six days over the Christmas holidays to write the script. And I said, don't worry, Nikki, we're gonna get this done in six days. So we sat at this little desk, you know, and we're writing and she would, she would get a phone call, you know, and she would, she would take the phone call and it would be like her boyfriend and she would be suddenly all happy the boyfriend called and then two seconds later he said something that she would start yelling then she would start crying then she would just hang up the phone and I'm like Nikki we don't have time for this you know we have six days to write a screenplay I don't want you to get distracted and suddenly like on the second phone call it dawned on me duh this is what this is about. I need to embrace these phone calls, put the phone calls in the script. And also this, you know, volatile range of emotions of the fact that within 30 seconds, she could go from ecstasy to tears to anger, all in 30 seconds. That's what it was about. This 13 year old, you know, emotionality, volatility that I needed to embrace that, not discourage that kind of chaos, because it was about chaos, the movie. So you see those phone calls, a couple of those phone calls are in the script. And then also it gave me the whole idea of how to shoot the movie. You know, it could not be shot in static shots, lockdown thing. She's not a lockdown person. Her energy was moving. I, I shot it like war photography, chasing what's happening, running into the living room, the door slams, boom. Now you got to go here. So that was why it was very handheld and very kinetic. Oh, all right. So, you, but you, you got to create a character for Tracy. Uh, she is an innocent teenager at the start, but you know, she's also has to take on a lot of adult roles. The mom is actually has to take on stuff that she shouldn't be taking on around her business, babysitting, even dealing with the drug, you know, boyfriend. Um, how did you approach Tracy's arc? Because I know you wanted to be true to what Nikki was going through, but you also have to make a story, you know. Right. And, and so Tracy was very much based on Nikki. That was our first handshake. And actually we had a contract. I made a contract with her that I had never directed a movie. She'd never acted in a movie, but if we somehow got to make this, she would get to play herself. So she was going to play the Evan Rachel Wood character. And so we were trying to make it true to her life experience. However, she was in the middle of living it 
at the time we were writing it and shooting it. So there was one moment I kept thinking, you know, this script's going to keep going. We're going to have a scene of her and, you know, um, therapy with her mom or who knows what. And, and all of a sudden it was just like, I'm typing on the, you know, on my laptop and I just stopped like, that's the end. <laughs> I just kind of knew that was the last scene. And I just stopped it right then. And in some ways it did have, the structure already built in, you know. Now, uh, we're interested because because I know I've read some interviews, so we'll get to Holly Hunter in a bit, what she brought. But when you first wrote the mom character, uh, she could have been a one dimensional villain, like the mom drove her kid to drugs and, you know, just evil mom. But you made her very complex. She was nurturing, care, you know, she cared about everybody, helped other people. She's a recovering addict, sometimes asked her kids to do too much. How did you approach? you know, uh, her character, which had her also a certain blindness to, you know, what's going on with her daughter. Well, she was, of course, inspired by Nikki's real mom, Cheryl, who's an amazing mom that has had a difficult, she herself had a difficult childhood, you know, no role model, you know, all kinds of crazy things. And she's my friend. So actually, I've known her for a long time. I love her. And uh, she was brave enough to let us make this movie. You know, I also had her sign. So, of course, when I ask everybody to sign their life rights, you know, no one thought I would ever get it made because I'd already been trying for 15 years to get other movies made. And we know how hard it is. So they're like, sure, I'll sign here. But the thing was about, uh, when Nikki and I had our six day writing session, by the end of that session, we had the screenplay. We had the opening, middle, all the scenes, but the mother was two dimensional because it was from Nikki's point of view. And at that point in her life, she hated her mother and saw her mother as a cardboard villain. So, and just completely evil. So after Nikki went back to middle school uh, in January, I'm like, okay, I gotta go over there and hang out with Cheryl and make Cheryl make this character more real. So I kind of added back in the humanity. Uh, I was, I mean, it was, I've spoken to a lot of family and friends about this movie and every single parent said this is the scariest movie they've ever seen or will ever see in the future. Uh, now, when you did, even from the beginning of the draft, did you feel that this was gonna be an important theme for you? The power, the, the, the parents feeling the powerlessness of helping their child or that it kind of evolved when you were writing? No, that's what I felt because I was trying to be a fake therapist without having any training. I was trying to help Nikki. I was just completely ill-equipped as a, you know, a whatever, an auntie kind of parent, you know, and our uh, aunt parent, you know, like an aunt and not an anti-parent. <laughs> I'm pro-parent. But anyway, uh, the thing was, I, there's a character in there that's like a, ther she comes over, she's a real estate agent. That was kind of me. I would come over to the house with some books like, hey, let's try this. And it was all just dumb. You know, I, I couldn't be helpful until I started figuring out that we would do cinema therapy, write a story together, which would become therapy for Nikki in its own way. And in fact, as you know, we were on Oprah. Um, the movie was shown to 40 mothers and 40 daughters. And then Nikki went on Oprah with a therapist. Afterwards, the mothers and daughters got up there and talked about their experience watching the movie together. We also went all around the country and the world with different like juvenile court judges and you know people that work at rehab centers and doing Q and A's on the movie as, as the cinema therapy because you could talk to your daughter about it as if, would you do what Evie did? Would you do what Tracy did without saying, would you do this? Mm. You, know, you could transfer it to the, another character. And so, yes, we knew that it was gonna be, you know, tough. You know, I knew it was gonna be a very tough subject. In fact, it was extremely tense day when I decided I need to let Cheryl, Nikki's mom, hear the screenplay. So I'm sitting in her chair in the mirror and and Cheryl has big scissors and is cutting my hair because she was my you know hairdresser she's cutting my hair and I'm reading this screenplay 
And I'm looking at those scissors getting near my neck as the very hardcore tense moments were happening in the screenplay. Some of them Cheryl knew about and some she didn't know had happened. And it was, and we would have to stop. Okay, haircut is on pause, stop, hug, group hug, tears, uh, therapy session. Now we go back to the haircut. <laughs> All right, so you have a draft of your screenplay. Uh, it's an R-rated movie about 13-year-old girls getting into sex, drugs, alcohol, and dropping the F-bomb. How did you get someone to give you money to make this movie is the question we have. The question. We went everywhere. Of course, everybody was said exactly what you said. Who would go see this? Who's it made for? This is nuts, you know? And so everybody said, of course, no. And Fox Searchlight, who I love, love, love. We all love Fox Searchlight for the beautiful movies they've made. You know, they said, look, we like this, but we're not going to support it. However, if this was Peter Rice at the time, however, if you if you make it, and it gets into Sundance and if it comes out good and if we like it, then we would like to, then we'll help you distribute it. If, 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 if that was not money, money, money. So, you know, we had to go around and I had just done the movie Laurel Canyon with Lisa Cheladinko as a production designer. And I really liked the, the producer and he saw how hard I worked and I gave him, I sent him the script and I also sent, gave the script to somebody at David O. Russell's house who was at a party. There was Michael London, the producer, and his wife is a therapist for teenage girls. And I told her what I was doing. She said, my husband's a producer. I get, I had the script in my car, handy, you know, ready, ready for action at any time. Gave him the script the next morning by 10 o'clock, Michael called and said, I want to help you get this made. So between Michael and I introduced the two uh, producers, they said, we'll both help you get this made. And they each did crucial things like Michael introduced me to Holly's manager. Uh, Jeff Levy Hinty got the first seed money. You know, so we just started building. I'm just crying, I have to make this. Even I literally was crying, you know, telling them I've got to make this movie. I feel that it it's going to matter to the world and I want to do it. And, and so the tears moved them. They motivated them a little to find, they saw how much I cared about it, you know. So then, all right, so then ultimately when you, what was the first meeting like to Holly Hunter to get her to do it? She's an Oscar winner at the time. She's a huge star. What, how did, how does a first time director then actually pull that off? Oh my God, it was nerve wracking. Now, like I mentioned, and I advise all directors to do this. I've been taking acting classes in between jobs for the last five years. So that gave me more confidence of speaking in public, speaking to other people, because I used to just be like, you know, very shy. So anyway, um, I, I t the, the lookbook that I can show you guys in a minute, I made the lookbook. I also shot little footage, you know, with different actors in it and with Nikki in it. And we, uh, Michael London got to Holly's manager and he liked the script. And, and Michael said, you've got to see Catherine's presentation. I go present to the manager. The manager got excited. He sends it to Holly. Holly gets excited when she sees the dialogue, like she hadn't seen anything like that before. So it's, like I think Thursday afternoon and I get this call, hey, Holly wants to meet with you tomorrow. I'm like, cool, in New York and I'm in LA. I'm like, what? And so I just like grabbed my video camera, drove home from the casting office. I mean, drove to Nikki's house and I filmed Nikki and her mom talking to Holly, you know, on my little video camera saying, this is real. Here's our house. Here's our life. And Cheryl literally said, Holly, I want you to play me because you have bigger boobs than I do, you know? And so it was very real. And then I just hopped on the red eye and showed up at Holly's house, terrified, Academy Award winner for best actress. I walk in there and sit on the floor of her loft. I open up my camera, show her the little video of Cheryl talking to her and, and she sees how real it is. And she goes, wow, this is cool. But I think um, I've been burned by working with first time directors before and you've never directed anything. I don't, I'm not, I don't know, you know. She goes, I thought you were missing three things in the screenplay, three scenes, let me tell you about them. So Holly acts out those three scenes. 
I'm taking my notes. I'm like, okay. And then I get on the plane. I write those scenes into the script, weave them in. By the time I land, email them back to her. She goes, and I heard later, she said, okay, this director listened to me. She heard it. She figured out an artful way to incorporate what I said, which was brilliant. And of course I should incorporate it. And then she signed on right then. Well, you know, I mean, there's, there's very few parts that are so real like this, that are willing to take chances. So for an actress, I understand the appeal of like, I want to play a part like this because I don't get these, you know, they're not written that often. Um, all right, so now obviously I think the most complicated casting is Tracy. You have a young, that's a very demanding role, you know, for a young actor to play. What did you see in Evan Rachel Wood that made you feel she could capture that character? Well, I saw her in the TV show once and again, and I thought she was just, you know, freaking fantastic in that show. So at first, her agents didn't even look at the material. First time director, we're offering, you know, a, a box of dirt for pay and all that stuff. Why would we do it? X-rated movie. As soon as Holly signed on to it, she really respected Holly. And so at that time, though, remember what I said earlier, Nikki and I, Nikki was going to play that part. And meanwhile, I had been auditioning other girls. Nikki would, I, I paid for Nikki to go to acting classes, learn how to act. Every weekend I did scenes with her, shot scenes with her. So she was going on tape with other girls, right? And we didn't find anybody that was, Nikki was always more advanced than everybody else. <laughs> like she already looked like Evie, like the bad girl and everybody else. Cause I did not want anybody that wasn't 13 years old. I did not want an 18 year old girl. I wanted a 13 year old. So Evan came in and she had just turned 14. So she was about two months old, too old. <laughs> but I thought I could make an exception when she came in and I met with her, you know, in per I'd seen her work, but I saw her in person and we talked about the script. She had a deep understanding and connection to it. And then I'm like, oh my God, this, this could work. And then all of a sudden her mother comes in and says, you know, I got one problem with the script, a big problem. I'm like, oh dear, you know, I'm, I'm like panicking. She doesn't want to do the kissing scene or this scene or the cutting, you know, I'm just like, what am I going to have to change? And guess what the mother, her mother said, she goes, this is too mild. You toned it down, you watered this down. What we really go through is much more intense than this. I'm like, whoa, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I realized that, you know, she and her mother were on board. They understand they understood the reality for some girls this age. Now you just came off Vanilla Sky starring Tom Cruise. <laughs> so there must've been some challenges coming from a Tom Cruise budget movie to this. So you had to work with your production designer. You also, Elliot Davis, who was a frequent collaborator with you after, uh, you know, who was your cinematographer using a lot of handheld dirt. So how did you, what was the approach? How are you going to shoot the film? What did you want the look of the film to be when you didn't actually have the normal budget you were accustomed to? Well, I'm going to do my slides in a minute, but I have to say one funny thing. I love what you just said, because Vanilla Sky, I knew I was on a big budget movie with Tom Cruise when one day I looked over at the set and I saw the assistant cappuccino maker getting a massage by the full-time masseuse on the set. I'm like, whoa, I've hit the big time. Now, <laughs> on my movie, the budget was 1.5 million total on 13. We did not have a cappuccino maker and we did not have a masseuse. So <laughs> we, we didn't even have an off. I mean, that we have a white folding table and that's where the producer set out in the yard of each set that we went. That was the office. I still have that white folding table because all I got paid on the movie was $3 and the white folding table I got to keep. So, I, but I loved it. You know, I went to film school, UCLA. That was the most fun days for me. I love student filmmaking. I like to be in action mode. So, uh, you know, just quickly, this was a little lookbook. And the second that I finished the script, da -da -da -da, I typed this. What's the title gonna be? I just typed 13 and I stuck this picture of Nikki, you know, on the cover. I'm like, I guess that's the title, you know? <laughs> and this was how Nikki looked before I went to Van uh, Vancouver on the show, you know, little fun kid and overalls. And then when I came back, she looked like, you know, the art, talking about the art, when I came back, you know, she was all like, 
little baby J-Lo, like radical, you know, super cute. So how do I work with a production designer? Uh, this is an example. Um, this is, well, I knew that like 60% of the, the, the movie was going to be filmed in Tracy's house, okay? So this is a floor plan of the house. I wanted a lot of windows, you know, big banks of windows. And I wanted a lot of accesses that I could build depth into it. And I'll explain why. Like, for example, here was the beauty salon. Here's the kitchen, the laundry room. Okay, so you can see there'd be a window here. I could have somebody standing in the salon. And then you could see people behind you in the kitchen and even behind you in the doorway in the laundry room. That's in one direction. In the other direction, I could see depth this way door, salon, you know, and here I could see depth out on the patio or in between the two bedrooms. So I wanted a house that had a lot of lines of sight and had a lot of windows for a couple reasons. Like I mentioned, I wanted it to be a very kinetic with the energy of the teenage girls kinetic style of filming. So I didn't want to have light stands set up in all the rooms. I wanted to have natural light from the windows. And that was very important to me. And, you know, of course, I talked about this with the cinematographer and the production designer. How can we keep this flow going, you know, so that somebody could, for example, in this shot, run inside all in one take, run into the next room, run into the bathroom, run out there, and it all still looks good and lit. So we had the, uh, the lamps would that were actually in the house, they provided lighting and the windows provided lighting. So the, the house we were looking for had that open feeling, but not too big that didn't fit the income level of the person. And then of course, you, you don't want a white house. I mean, because that, there's no way the cinematographer can uh, control the light. White bounces all over the place. So you take the walls, kind of like what I have in my house, you paint them down to a blue or a blue gray or a color that can help control the light a little bit better. So, you know, all these things, the cinematographer, Elliot Davis, who was wonderful enough to do my first movie, even though he got paid like a box of dirt or whatever for it. And, uh, you know, minimum scale, I wasn't even union, I think at, at the beginning, but he saw that I had made this lookbook. He knew I was a production designer and he knew that I cared about how it looked, but I also cared more about the emotion. So he wanted to facilitate a stage that we could keep moving at all times. And the, and the decorator too. And so I would as set de set designer, production designer. So I told her I really cared about the rehearsal space and I wanted all the key pieces of furniture like the couch and everything in there, you know, five days before shooting so I could rehearse and I could kind of, we could think feng shui the situation. Like if I knew Holly would sit at this point on the couch, she would get lit from the window like natural beauty lighting. That's amazing. And I guess it's good lessons for our, our production students, how to, you know, use the space you have, you know, the natural lighting and think about this when they're making their films. Right. And if, cause if you want it to be continuous, like if you think about um, some movies, you will say, we'll say, we're going to shoot in that direction. And then they put a whole bunch of light stands here and we'll shoot like Holly's close up. Now we're going to turn around and shoot in that direction and shoot Evan's close up, put a lot of lights here. That is not the way I wanted to shoot. I wanted to shoot boom, every, you know, moving masters so that you really felt almost each sequence was shot like a play. People did not have to stop. We were all in the same frame. That's why I wanted the dip that you could see. Many times you'll see Evan Rachel Wood really close to the camera. And then you see behind her, all the other chaos that's going on. You see Holly, you see Nikki. In fact, there's even a scene where we have two and a half minute scene with no cuts in it, by the way. Oh, yeah. <laughs> As we composed it all with moving masters that still had that dynamic foreground, middle ground, background, but without having to cut it up because I wanted you to feel that this was really something that you were watching. And a lot of people felt like, oh my God, that's why a lot of parents uh, thought it was like a horror movie because you felt like, you know, Blair Witch brought you, you were really there watching the horror unfold. <laughs> oh yeah, you know, we felt it. <laughs> 
So like in, in the movie, we created a palette or a color scheme, you know, based on photographs and, you know, ideas of what the colors would be in the movie. But we also had an emotional kind of color palette when we went into color timing, the DI, which is just like Photoshop. And so at the beginning of the movie, her Tracy's Evan Rachel Wood's world is kind of normal and ordinary, like, you know, our worlds look every day. And then when she meets the bad girl, she starts to feel like she's going into a magical world and the skin tones get more beautiful and more golden. It starts to look more like a commercial, more beautiful. And then the further she goes into this world where they're experimenting with drugs and stuff, the colors actually start cranking up the chroma and getting more intense. So it's actually looking a bit harsh by the end they're do by the time they're doing drugs and things like that. And then at the end, when the girl, when the bad girl, Evie breaks up with her, uh, the color starts draining out. It almost goes to black and white. So We've got the movie in 30 seconds and I'll show it to you uh, right now. You can sort of see this arc. Uh, don't blink. <laughs> So then, all right, so that actually one of the questions we have the opening because you do set up this opening where Tracy is standing directly at the audience, making eye contact with the audience. Uh, the girls are punching each other, slapping each other in the face. So it's kind of where Tracy is getting to the lowest point. Why did you want to start at this moment of your film in Tracy's journey? Um, when Nikki uh, and her friends were kind of telling me all the things they were going through at that time, that was actually the scene that pretty much shocked me the most, you know, that this young girl who's very beautiful uh, would be hitting and asking to be hit and punched right in the face. I would just like kind of that just blew my mind. I'm like, how do you get to that point? And especially since I knew Nikki a few months before, it would never have occurred to her to do something like that. So I just thought that was almost the most startling moment and that's a good, that was just a good way to draw me in and draw the audience in. And early in the film, the scene that actually affected me the most uh, was when the flashback, almost within a flashback, when Tracy discovers mom's boyfriend snorting cocaine through the beer can. Uh, I mean, it's an interesting moment because mom thinks her daughter's innocent, but is exposing Tracy to this kind of stuff. It also leaves quite an impression on Tr Tracy about in regards to drug use. How important would you incorporate this scene and where did it kind of come from? Oh my God, I'm so glad you asked about that scene because that scene was never in the script. But about day three or day four of filming, um, and I had actually gone and interviewed the boyfriend, you know, and interviewed the mom and all that. And I really liked the boyfriend and, you know, I thought he was a great, you know, person and all that. So uh, the, he was pretty nice and decent through the script. And then one day Nikki came in and she's, I go, Nikki, you look kind of tired. It was a shooting day, like day three or four. And she goes, well, yeah, because I was at the emergency room all night because, you know, my mom's boyfriend OD'd and we had to go to the emergency room. I'm like, what, last night? And she goes, yeah, you made him look too good in this script, Catherine. <laughs> you need to show more of the real life. I'm like, whoa, okay. So I, we just improvised that scene and did that scene, you know, on yeah. the spot, really. Because it's also good, It's even though Holly wasn't in the scene technically, it really sets up a character because later we had the great performance when, from Holly, when she uh, sewed the leopard, Thing into the pants for mom invading her privacy so she's still treating her child like a child mm -hmm. and it was interesting pushing back how do you that how important was that scene for you because you were kind of showing mom is a little clueless not seeing her daughter growing up but not realizing she is she made her grow up too young almost 
Right, right. Made her grow up too fast. And I mean, the leopard thing was very complicated because the mom saw that she wanted the leopard pants yep. in the store. She couldn't afford them. So the mom thought she was doing the coolest thing. I'll go in and put them in her pants. And then, you know, of course, the daughter was at such odds with her mother that nothing her mother could do would be right at that moment, you know. So that was a kind of a heartbreaking scene of how far these two people that loved each other, how far apart they had grown you know but that was a very important scene to me yeah and you know and it was it was always a great moment because of uh you know and it does really cover how far they got and plus evie was great in that scene too kind of just oh because evie was just playing both sides she goes oh man i love these pants you know and she was just playing up to mel and all the time saying things like you know oh whatever food it was oh that's my favorite food too she was always working it you know well, and I, that's actually interesting to me because, again, she could have been just the villain. I think you need the audience to want to be a, drawn to Evie. Like, and we did, she did have a lot of good qualities. I mean, she wasn't manipulative, but at the same time, she was, she had the trauma, serious trauma. We empathize with her. I thought, so was that kind of you wanted to make Evie actually not just the villain kind of make the reason why Holly accepted her? Yeah, I mean, I think the Evie character was based on a real friend of Nikki's and a real friend of mine, that this person had a lot of fun qualities that you love this person, you wanted to hang out with them because they made everything fun. They were creative and saw things from a different point of view, but they could get toxic pretty quickly, you know, they could go, it could go wrong. So it's somebody that you're attracted to and repelled to at the same time. And actually I wanted to mention, cause I forgot to finish that sentence. You know, why didn't Nikki play herself? Because she actually, by the time we were ready to shoot this, she was too, she was not innocent enough to play the mm. innocent version of herself. She'd already matured past that. And we just couldn't find another actor that she was, you know, that changed the status because Nikki was always the more, you know, advanced one of every single character she played against. So this was a very traumatic situation. Nikki was heartbroken when I kept telling her, I don't think you can play yourself. And, you know, but that was her agreement and it was really tough, very tough for me. I wanted to honor the agreement, but then I would show her the tapes and then when she met Evan, you know, they fell in love and she was just like, okay, I'm going to accept this now. And you're going to play the other part. But the producers didn't even want her to play the other part. They're like, Catherine, she's untrained. And she also doesn't have, you know, she's living through this right now. So it's just like too crazy. But eventually it worked out. Yeah. Uh, I did. We did. Love, as soon as I were talking, I liked. I like the scene with dad. He comes in as a white man savior. I'm just going to talk to my daughter for five minutes and solve the problem work calls. <laughs> Evan Rachel Ward's performance is amazing in that scene. Just kind of like, because she, you know, she obviously wants her dad in the figure. So why did, he's been a dramatic ghost for the movie. Why did you want to make sure you bring in that cool, that really terrible dad that we all want to punch in the face? Well, the real dad isn't so terrible, you know, and he's a friend of mine too. And, uh, you know, it's just so difficult as a dad, like, you know, he and the wife probably married too young and they went separate ways. And, you know, he, uh, you know, all the things that he did getting a college degree, she didn't want to go that way. So they had become different people. And so he, you know, it was just hard for him to relate. And, you know, it was just so fun. in a nutshell, tell me in a nutshell, what's the problem? <laughs> but I want to, see him as a human too the guy himself was also very stressed out with his job obviously evan rachel would pokes at him like dad i know you need the job i know you need the money so the guy was going through tough stuff too you know but uh i mean we talked a little about you know obviously you don't shy away from taking on issues uh you know it's almost like there's no barrier between the audience and the characters you want the truth uh, how far, were you any concerns about how far you pushed stuff like the self-harming thing with the cutting? Or did you have any concerns like you did want to show that or or how do you want to address it? Well, I mean, that would, that's definitely a subject matter. Like, does it help people that watch this movie realize I'm not the only one that feels this way? Or does it inspire somebody? Oh, let me try that. You know, those are fine lines, you know, a lot, most the feedback I got was that this was a help, 
helpful to people to realize that they're not the only ones that feel this deeply upset, you know, stressed out about their life, you know, that, are, you know, most people felt like, wow, there's other people that understand me, you know. And also for parents too, understanding that their parents have a child dealing with that. It's very helpful to know that they're not alone, that there's just other people are experiencing and don't know how to help. And, and it was very crucial at the moment when Holly does see the marks on her daughter's hands, you know, that was just absolutely gut-wrenching moment, you know, that she didn't even, wasn't even aware of it, but it was heartbreaking for her, you know. All right, so similar, you do have this threesome scene with Evie, uh, you know, Tracy and the neighbor boy. How do you, how do you do a scene like that with young actors, that kind of complicated? Oh yeah. Since that kind of happened at my house with one of my tenants was very cute, you know, rented the back apartment. And I would see when I mentioned those slumber parties, I'd be like, where did everybody go? And they were swarming in his room. I'm like, oh my God, this is not a good situation. So, you know, the poor guy was like, hey, don't let him in my room. <laughs> yeah. um, I, I didn't ask for this. But um, so we had Kip Pardue, the wonderful actor that was in, and, you know, remember the Titans? He played Sunshine in that movie. And I thought he was so charming in that movie. And so he came over to my house one day to do a rehearsal with Evan and Nikki. And I think he thought, he told me, what do you mean they're 13 years old? I thought they were gonna be played by 18 year olds because I don't feel super comfortable working with having two 13 year olds kissing me or 14 year olds kissing me. I go, look, we're gonna do it all by the rules. We've got her, nobody's gonna do anything they don't feel comfortable in with. And um, we had, of course, we had the teacher there, the welfare worker there in the scene. Now that is the exact scene that we didn't do any cuts in. It's a two and a half minute scene with no cuts because I wanted you to kind of feel like, oh my God, how far is this gonna go or not go? So the, the school teacher at the beginning said, uh, who's the child welfare worker, uh, she said, now, first of all, there's a nipple zone on the guy, there's a nipple zone. You can't, the girls can't get anywhere three inches around near his nipple. They, they can't rub him or touch him. I'm like, okay, everybody understand the rule. Now height, since it's a one take and we see 360, the welfare worker and myself are hiding behind the couch, you know, with like a black cloth over us. And we're looking at a monitor. And then all of a sudden <laughs> I hear, she starts yelling out, nipple violation in the middle of a take. I was like, cut. I guess somebody got within three inches. You know? So everything was regulated. And of course, you know, everybody had to feel comfortable with what we were doing. And of course, Nikki's mom and her, you know, both Nikki and Evan's moms were there on the set too. So, <laughs> all right. So the scene, I mean, I mean the, the, the climax of the movie is you have, you said just black and white at this point. So we know she's in a dark place. She comes home, Evie has betrayed her, right, right out to Brooke. Brooke is blaming, you know, Evie. You have so much going on. You have mom finally realizing her daughter you know, has a serious problem. How do you weave that in? Could you almost have four different characters having different arcs all happening at the same time? Oh, yeah, and that was intense, uh, you know, so that was obviously in the writing, Nikki and I had worked on that scene, and then I had worked on it a little bit more, we worked on it in the rehearsal, too, and then on the day was so intense, because after, you know, we go into the kitchen, and Evan, you know, falls on the floor, and Holly sees that she's cut herself, it was a very heavy scene, and, you know, Evan's crying, super emotional, I made sure that nobody was on the set except for just a couple people, and at the end, Evan yells, cut, and I'm like, oh my god, she's broken, so I, you know, take her and walk her into the bedroom, we lie down on the bed, I'm hugging her before COVID, you know, I'm hugging her, are you okay, are you just rocking her in my arm, she's sobbing, she's sobbing, and I, I said, well, we got that take. You don't need to do it again. She goes, what do you mean? I'll do it again. And I go, but you yelled cut. She goes, I didn't say cut. I said, God. So I had misunderstood her, but I'm hugging her. I'm hugging her. And then Nikki walked in and saw me hugging her. And Nikki goes, 
hey, this is my life. Why aren't you hugging me? I'm like, okay, one arm on Evan, one arm on Nikki. Then Holly comes in. I'm living through this too. It's very emotional for me. I need a hug. So I'm trying to like octopus my arms around her. Then Deborah Kara Unger comes in. This is traumatic for me too. I'm trying to find a way to hug, you know, four women. <laughs> I never hugged so many people in my life <laughs> because it was very heavy for all of us going through this scene. Everybody just put their heart into it. Which actually, but if you think it ties back to which I thought one of the best dramatic moments is when throughout the movie, Tracy's been shutting the door on mom. Literally and figuratively, I shut the door on her. Don't hug me at the end. Mm -hmm. It was such a touching scene where mom's like, no, I'm not going to be your best friend anymore. I'm going to, a mom, uh, you're not shutting the door, I'm hugging you. It was a really sweet moment. Was, did you always want to end with that moment of them together sleeping and the color is actually returning in the bedroom with the sunlight, but did you want a semi-bittersweet ending or did we had maybe other thoughts? Yes, no, I wanted that. And then I realized um, that I had to add the one more scene of Evan on the merry-go-round yeah. screaming because it really wasn't over. I, and this is going back to, from the personal to the movie. I thought when Nikki and I finished the script that this was going to be a healing experience for Nikki and her mom. And I thought, wow, I was about to pat myself on the back that I had really done something great and, you know, created therapy and now they're going to be happy. That was you can't heal somebody that quick. You can't heal problems that quickly. And so like one day, even after we'd written the screenplay, we were about to start shooting. I get a call from Nikki's mom, Catherine, you better come over here and get Nikki because we're at war with each other. And so I'm driving over there like, okay, man, it's cool. Breathe, breathe. You're, you're, I'm thinking I'm going to heal the situation. I get over there. By the time I get there, Mom and Nikki are fine, but Nikki is now very mad at a school friend and wants me to drive her to the school friend's house so she can beat her up. And I'm like, what? You know, no, we're not going to go beat anybody. So like, you know, it was only like 20 minutes from she hated her mom to now she was going to beat somebody. So it was an ongoing struggle, you know, through this phase. And I just thought I have to show that it is ongoing, you know. <laughs> but, but I think at least it shows that they're starting going in the right direction. There yeah. was some healing, you know, he gave us something because it, it's just yeah. very yeah. cathartic. Even the screaming's yeah, you know, which is on the merry-go-round. Felt like a normal teenager will scream because every the angst. And a release, exactly. And I and I did, you know, Holly. Holly does not obey her daughter. She doesn't leave me alone. She does hold it. Don't hold me. She holds her by just being there, being there for her. She's showing how much she does love her. You know, which is that ties back to the dad scene because all Evan Rachel wants is what is the dad to actually Tracy dad to be a part of her life. Even though they want to fight it too, they want almost want to fight. I feel like you care enough to. Uh, okay, well, thirteen wasn't. We're gonna we're gonna open up in a minute, but thirteen was not the only coming of age true life drama you've ever directed. You also <laughs> directed Twilight. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what were kind of the fun parts, challenges, and fun parts in tackling such a beloved franchise? Walking into that. <laughs> well, it was awesome. I mean, at the time. Um, it was beloved by its, you know, online fan base, but the rest of the world didn't really know about it. In fact, it was put into turnaround at Paramount and no studio wanted to make it. And so a little upstart, Summit Entertainment, who's mostly had done, you know, foreign sales films, they said, we, we want to make this. Uh, but they didn't even, they had an old script from Paramount. I read the script and I was like, mm -mm, no good. I went into my first meeting with them and I said, this script has to go into the trash can because I had read the novel. And I said, that script had Bella, you know, as a track star, not an awkward, relatable kid, but a track star. And it had, it, by the ending, she was on a jet ski being chased by the FBI. And I'm like, what? the hell this has nothing to do with why people love the book you don't need to turn this into an action you know fbi jet ski movie it can be more true to the book which is about this you know crazy passionate first love that everybody's gone through so we can all relate to this you know shakespeare tackled it in romeo and juliet you know this like 
ecstatic love. So I said, we need to write the screenplay more like the book. And so at the time, the only reason I got hired to do this, being a female director, as we know, nobody at that time had ever, woman had ever directed a franchise and really only one other, one or two others have done it since. Um, you know, obviously Patty Jenkins with Wonder Woman, but at that time, nobody thought this was a valuable property or a big franchise. So I got to make it much more like an indie film. At that time, Kristen and Rob were not big names. There were no big stars in it. I got to do it very personal, the same way I cast, you know, uh, 13 at my house. That's where we did the chemistry reads and everything. So I got to make it like an indie film. Yeah. Well, we're going to bring on Sonia Sherman. She's one of our student producers on the show, and she's going to have a few audience questions. Hi, Sonia. Hello. Thank you so much for coming. Um, so you touched on this, but it took nine years to break your record with Twilight. Um, I'm wondering, you know, we have a lot of aspiring uh, female screenwriters, directors, filmmakers. And I'm just curious, you know, looking back on that, do you think the industry is moving in the right direction? And would you have any advice for us as we kind of try to get our foot in the door in the industry? Yes, I do think it's moving in the right direction. Look at all the awesome women that are nominated this year and their films have been, you know, beloved and might win the Oscar, best director, a woman, yay, good chance, uh, or best film, all kinds of great stuff. So we are moving in the right direction. We're telling more interesting stories, diverse stories. And so I think, you know, if we took a lesson from some of the films that we've seen that people love this year, and let's say even 13, finding something that's meaningful to you yourself that you can really connect to and relate to in my case nikki and her family were all very close friends of mine and i felt her pain and her parents pain you know in in a um you know nomad land that was a came from a real place and you know there's so many beautiful uh stories out there so find something that you really care passionately about and you feel it you know in your heart and then what I was showing you some slides from a thing called fix it and prep. Be really prepared for the moment that you actually get your chance to do this. Make sure you have taken the acting classes so you can talk to actors. Make sure you've taken the writing classes and you've had a lot of people read your screenplay and critique it. And then you try to make it better and make sure that you understand camera and lenses and art and color. And, you know, there's so many cool classes you can take and ways you can educate yourself. So when you do get that chance, you're going to make something that's super good, as good as it can be. So you'll have a chance to make the next project. Great. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, we have a question from Evangelina. She says, you have so many great ideas. Do you struggle with editing and compromising some of your ideas that might not work out? Kind yes. of like killing your babies type of thing. <laughs> yes. In fact, I had a slide, uh, which we, in the presentation on 13, this whole thing that I wanted to show how Evan and Nikki were influenced by commercials. So I wanted to imagine them in these fantasy commercials with golden light and everything. Well, we couldn't afford that, no freaking way. So it was like, that is not gonna make it into the movie. That was a little bit heartbreaking, but then I'm like, okay, let's do it with that. Let's, let's move on. Then I was told by the producer, no car can be moving in the movie because on our budget, we don't have cars that are going to work. Probably they're going to probably break down. So you need, so you'll see, if you look at 13, you'll see Holly is supposed to be driving them to Melrose to go shopping, but instead we're just at a crosswalk and I just had people crossing in front. So we're in a car, but the car is not moving. And then there's one scene where the car was going to move when the boyfriend is giving uh, her a ride home. That car did not work. They were, the producer was exactly right. It broke down. There are, you only see half the car because two guys are pushing it out of frame, you know? <laughs> so you have to be able, that's where the comedy improv, like, okay, you got a problem. Oh, it's raining in twilight. There was a scene at the beach where I wanted this beautiful sunny day. We're going to be on the beach da, 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 with Jacob and all that stuff pouring down rain, but not normal rain. It's coming at an angle where it ruined three monitors on the steady cam. We couldn't even shoot. It was like gale force winds. I'm like, guys, we can't shoot today. They said, you have to keep shooting cat. So I'm like,
I see some surfers, real surfers there on the Oregon coast. I run over and they had vans. I run over to them. Hey, dude, we're making a movie. Can I use your van? So we get three vans in a row. We kind of circle the vans like circling the wagons. I move the scene into a van and, El, and uh, you know, Bella's sitting there in the van. That's in the movie. Watch it. You'll see it. You remember it if you saw Twilight. But you have to be able to improv. My beautiful beach scene didn't work. Boom, we're in a van. So you have to be able to go with the flow. Wow. Great story. <laughs> all right. So our final question that we ask all of our guests, um, we're going to ask you to play professor for a second since we're at an academic institution. Um, if you had to assign a movie or a script to read for aspiring writers and directors and filmmakers, what would it be and why? Oh my God, okay, um, let's see. Well, I'm gonna go for 13, just, and I know that's cheesy, but you know, the thing is, um, I had the David O. Russell test on this script. David O. Russell directed Three Kings that I was a production designer and also so many great movies, you guys know him. But I had given him another script and the and the and he read about, I said, can you read this and give me notes? And he read like two paragraphs and he goes, I'm not reading another page and just threw it away. I'm like, why? He goes, there's exposition in there. And I go, what do you mean? There's been only one line of dialogue. And he said, and the line was something like, hey, I'll meet you at the, at the uh, West Side Cove. And he goes, two friends would have said, I'll meet you at the Cove, not the West, because they know you're, you're, and so I'm like, oh my God, that is hardcore. And for me, I went through 13 like a zillion times before he could read it to make sure I didn't have exposition. So it's a good example of like no exposition. I hope, I think, I doubt, dare anyone to show me where the exposition is. And there's not no repetition because we had such a low budget. It was only a 95 page script. So I think that's a good example for get your script as tight as possible, concise as possible, make sure it moves. And then you only shoot the scenes. You only spend money on scenes that are definitely gonna be in the movie to the best you can. Uh, but I'm sure there's a million better examples. That's just the only one I could think of because you put me on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the point. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. So, Catherine, thanks so much for sharing your insights in this movie. I mean, with complete honesty, like 13, which is a raw, honest movie. Uh, of course, now that the pandemic's coming closer to an end, we hope we can bring you up to UCSB and share whatever movie you want to see in the Pollock Theater and talk to our students. That would be fun. Maybe, yeah, that would be fantastic. And thank you guys, great questions and lovely to meet everybody and everybody have an awesome day. Yay. Thank you so much, Catherine. Thank you. Great, bye-bye. Bye-bye, the audience.